Hey gang, I am Joe Whittleman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Tonight, we're gonna take a break from gear. I know, last week I said we'd dive into modifiers. I'm not gonna lie, I'm dreading that one. So I'm gonna push it back a week. That way I can also get a little bit more organized with it. I'll have a couple more props to show you guys all set up. So tonight, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about something that I've heard a lot of photographers mention in dribs and drabs and bits and pieces recently. And that is what is your least favorite part of being a photographer? And of course, we're gonna do a Q&A, but be forewarned, this is gonna be a really, really short show if you don't participate. I've got a few things that people have shared already, but look, you're here, I wanna know, what is your least favorite part of photography? And like, you don't get to say, oh, nothing, I love all of it. You have something, I have. I have a few things. Honest, I do, right? So we'll do the Q&A also, and I'll do my best to answer all of your questions before we wrap up, okay? And of course, if you're watching the replay, you'll be able to find chapters in the description afterwards. It usually takes me about an hour to get those uploaded, so you can skip ahead to the parts of the show that you really wanna see and ignore the parts that you don't. And by the way, if you're watching the replay, please leave me a comment. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're watching from. Look, if you're gonna take the time to watch the video, Come on, do me a solid, right? It's not for my ego for crying out loud. The more comments and the more thumbs up, the more YouTube shares the show with other photographers, which helps to build the audience. And that helps me, okay? So those of you that are here already, we got a lot of people here, right? Ty's here from New York. I got Corey here in Granite City, Nolan, Florida, Crystal from like a mile and a half away. Uh, let's see, TC's here, Philip in Australia, Thursday, happy Thursday. Joe in California, FN89 down in Pensacola. I got Ron also on Thursday, Lynn in New York, Nicola in Italy, Peter in England, Rich in Colorado Springs. You guys are awesome, James in Alaska. Thank you, all of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every night. So you know what? I am gonna go ahead and I'm gonna skip news tonight. I, I really do want to get into the conversation. So quite seriously, those of you that are here, what is your least favorite part of photography? Already, Crystal, I know you have a couple things. Start typing, put them in there. Like a lot of you, I know, have things that are your least part. TC already said it's culling. I want to talk about some of these things and you'll understand why as we get into the conversation. Um, one thing I I did want to share, uh, let's do it as, uh, we'll call it Joe doing an I told you so. Not a big I told you so, but I want to go ahead and share this. And that is, um, you guys know that I'm not a big fan of all the, the articles that necessarily show up on the photo blogs and that, right? But F-Stoppers has an article that they posted today, mistakes made and lessons not learned by the photographic industry. Uh, and I will point out it's stuff you heard me talk about before. Of course, one of the first things they talk about is Sony all the different camera bodies, then they get into Lightroom's big issues, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm just gonna say, hey, look, right? I, I don't say this stuff to stir things up. I say this stuff to hopefully make you think twice before you run out and buy a new camera or get the latest software or, you know, see that there's like 10 YouTubers using Capture One. So, oh my God, I need to be using Capture One when most of you don't, it just makes your life harder, right? It's that kind of a thing. So I wanna try and keep you practical so that you can really advance your skills, all right? So this topic, that's it. I'm not even gonna tell you about my classes, nothing. Let's dive in, right? So I'm counting on you again, or it's gonna be a short show, not kidding, all right? But here's the thing about this topic of like, what's your least favorite part? Um, I want to give you a couple different sides to this conversation. For, for me, I have talked a lot. You've probably heard me talk if you've watched several of these episodes that I kind of feel like I've been able to cheat the system and haven't had to do the real job thing that often in my life, right? And as a result of that, I really do love what I do. I really am fully immersed in photography every day. And when I say every day, I'm talking all or part of seven days a week. Now, that being said, 
I'm also a bit of a workaholic. I am also a person that's wanting to constantly try new things and do new things. And I set very high standards for the work that I do. And as a result, I burn myself out from time to time, right? And I'm going to be completely honest with you right now. I'm burnt out. And it's because of a piece of my photography world. And hopefully this is not going to be your problem. Because if this is your problem, we need to talk. But it's a piece of my photography world that honestly, it's just killing me right now. I, I am not behaving well as a result of it because uh, my tolerance is just fried, right? I'll get to it in a second. But I think that it's important to every so often not brush these things under the rug and kind of try and ignore them. Um, not beat yourself up either because you don't like them. I'm a big solution-oriented person. I believe in finding solutions, right? If, if there's a problem or if there's something that I don't like having to do, but I've got to do it, especially if I have to do it on an ongoing basis, I want to find a way to simplify it or, or you know, potentially for that matter, offload it and not have to deal with it. But if it's a part of making my work look great, I still have to set high standards, right? I can't just ignore it. So I'm a big believer in every now and then, you've got to kind of take stock of these things. And look, I'm assuming for a lot of you, because it is for me off and on, multiple things, not just one thing, multiple things. And throughout my career, that thing, whatever it is that I least enjoy, it has changed. It has evolved. It depends on what kind of photography I've been doing. I mean, certainly when I was doing portraits and weddings, there were things that I enjoyed uh, that were very different or didn't enjoy, I should say, that were very different than when I was doing newspaper work and photojournalism. When I was doing newspaper work and photojournalism, like any newspaper photographer, I hated doing grip and grins, you know, the, the check presentations and the handshakes. They were boring. They were dull, right? And this, of course, was back in the late 70s and early to mid 1980s when newspapers were using pictures big and we actually had some creative freedom in how we, we did our work. Uh, still had to do things faithfully. I don't mean creative in the sense of let's retouch, but I just mean newspapers would use two or three or four pictures instead of one, you know, barely bigger than a business card, right? So um, it was a great time to be a newspaper photographer, but hated having to do those check presentations and the grip and grins. So every element, every phase, there are going to be things that really get you going. Like you can't wait to do them. They're, it's the stuff that you enjoy the most. And there's going to be the stuff that if you catch yourself from time to time and you're honest, you're going to realize that's the stuff that I kind of procrastinate on. That's the stuff that I push to the side. That's the stuff that's going to take me three extra cups of coffee to get through or, you know, in my case, a couple cans of soda to get through because I just don't really want to do it. That's the stuff that every now and then we got to address. So I posted this question on Facebook today. I posted this question in my uh, Tog Knowledge community. And of course, I'm asking you and I'm seeing finally we got some good stuff coming in here. Okay. Uh, and I want to try and, you know, not just read the list, but I want to talk a little bit to try and, and talk about some problem solving. Plus, I am going to do you the solid since you're helping me with this information. Already, I can tell you I'm seeing some things go through that are going to be great topics for us to talk about in the near future for an episode or two or maybe three of the last frame. So I'll tell you what's burning me out right now. Um, and, it, and it's a couple of things, but there's one that kind of just rises to the top, and that is social media. But it's not the way that you think. In fact, I see quite a few of you have typed in like dealing with social media, sales and marketing, that kind of stuff. I don't mean it in that extent. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I'm pretty good at the social media game, right? I've got a huge following. I know the drill. Not a problem. So I don't mean it that way. I, I don't mind social media in that regard. I'm actually one of those weird people that thinks social media is amazing. And I think that it's an incredible gift 
to photographers, not only for the purpose of sharing our work, but also for just what we're doing right now, finding like-minded people to be able to talk with and communicate with and, and interact with about our photography. And the best part, really the best part, for sales and marketing. So I will tip my hand. Most of you that struggle with social media when it comes to sales and marketing, you're not really struggling with social media. You are struggling with sales and marketing. Social media is actually really simple. And I can prove it to you. Maybe not get to it tonight, but I can prove it to you that social media is simple. I swear to God, no BS, no baloney. That's not like a clickbait statement. It's simple. Okay. But why am I burned out about it right now? I'm burned out about it because I'm getting old. I just said a minute ago, I love it. So this is not a boomer statement. Sorry. Okay. Uh, in fact, for this conversation, I'm going to choose to be Gen X, not a boomer. I was born in 1960, which if you look it up, some websites will tell you 1960 was the last year of the boomers. Other websites will tell you 1960 was the first year of Gen X. So I'm going to, I'm going to identify as Gen X tonight, but it doesn't matter. The point is, what I'm learning is this. We have had this evolution, and, and I'm only going to reference it in the photography world. I completely understand that this problem goes way beyond photography. But I deal with photographers all day, right? And that is that social media has encouraged, and some of you are going to get offended. So hear me out to the end before you choose to really be offended and have something to say. And then by all means, disagree with me. Feel free. Okay, because some of you will disagree with what I'm about to say, but do me a favor, please, and hear me to the end. Um, we have evolved with this idea, and this is an older generation scenario. This is a baby boomer and a Gen Xer and some millennials, some millennials that subscribe to this. So you notice I'm not talking about younger millennials, and I'm definitely not talking about Gen Z. These are, you know, our college kids and kids that are just out of college, kids that are coming into college. They don't have this problem in part because they're not using Facebook. They're not using Instagram. They're definitely not using Twitter. They're avoiding that crap. They're using WhatsApp. They're taking their circle of friends that they communicate with, and they're doing it privately offline. Offline as, as compared to Facebook and that. They're using social media, but they're using the apps that allow you to have more private groups, more kind of closed circles. So those in the baby boomer generation, the Gen X and the older millennials have evolved to feel that it is their responsibility in many cases. Some of you that are here are going to be guilty of this. So again, just hear me out to the end. And then by all means, you can argue with me. Okay. I'll take the argument tonight. But they have evolved to feel that it is their responsibility to have an opinion, an opinion about everything. If it's on social media, I should have an opinion and I should type something rudely and obnoxious. Now, here's where it becomes a problem for me. One, a personality flaw of my own. When somebody is rude and obnoxious to me, my trigger is to be rude and obnoxious right back. I'm not proud of that. But I'll own it for the conversation because I, I look, I'm not just throwing bombs at people here. I, I'm being honest with you. This is why I'm burnt out. And I feel that way because it angers me when somebody has to be rude and obnoxious. I'll give you an example. Those of you that follow me on social media or you're in my community, you know that for about two months now, I've been posting a photo quote of the day, the images, et cetera. So just so you know, that costs me literally about 70 hours worth of work to build that database of quotes, a year's worth of those quotes. It costs me $50 a month for the technology behind it. Actually, a little bit more than that, probably about $55 a month for the technology that's behind creating those images. Those images are actually created automatically via a computer system network uh, every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S. I, I don't make those images, right? So uh, it's a pretty cool setup. But I do that, and I share those quotes with a link to a website that will teach you about the photographer. And by the way, if you've never noticed that, every one of those posts with the photo quotes, there is a link where you can go and you can learn about the photographer who made that quote, right? So the people, of course, that just drive me clean out of my mind 
are the people that within five minutes of one of those quotes going up every morning, it's like, that's wrong. I disagree. <sighs> Why? It's, it's as if I have said to the world, this is the way it works. And you need to adapt that. Like their tone is so offended, so butthurt that they have to argue and debate about how wrong that quote is. And so the irony of it is, they're having an argument with a photographer, not me, many of those photographers are dead, they're long gone. But in every one of the cases, they're having an argument with a photographer who's much more accomplished than they are, who's relatively well known. And in many of the cases, they don't even know who the hell a photographer is. They're having an argument because they're taking the words at face value with no understanding of the words, which by the way, is part of why I share the link. So people can learn from it. So, you know, at first, I'm not gonna lie, I had this bad habit, I would engage, bad idea that never ends well. And then I just decided, you know what? Screw that. I'm gonna delete the comments. I'm gonna delete the negative comments. And the best part about deleting negative comments for the rest of you, I will tell you this. And even for those of you that run a business, you're gonna read a lot of stuff that says never delete negative comments if you run a business. Uh, I completely disagree, but, but there's some context. We'll talk about that when we talk about your sales and marketing problems another night. Uh, I delete the comments because number one, it's an opinion. This person's not offering up any facts, they're offering up an opinion. They're debating this quote from a very well-known, very accomplished photographer. And you've all heard me say before, opinions, you know, they're like a certain body part, everybody's got one. Who cares, right? So that's reason number one I deleted. Reason number two is when I went to school, and I don't know about you, but I haven't heard anybody tell me otherwise yet. There was only ever one teacher teaching in a classroom at a time. And so my pages or my community, that's my classroom. I'm teaching. I had this weird idea that the people, like all of you that are watching this, that are listening right now, I had this weird idea that you're all intelligent enough to be able to take anything that I say or write or post, evaluate it, and say, there's value in that, or he's an idiot. There's no value. I don't like that idea. I'm going to do something else. Why is there a need to go back online and simply be rude, right? And so, you know, then I had a couple of people call me out. It's like, you deleted my comment. Oh my God, you know, First Amendment. Like, whoa, wait a minute. You're talking to a person who started their life as a photojournalist. I am a firm believer in the First Amendment, but the First Amendment is, is the press. It's the media. It's our ability to say things. When you come to my social media page or my community, the First Amendment does not apply. I'm not breaking any policies of any of the social media websites by deleting it. And there is nothing anywhere that says that you have the right to publicly debate me or argue with me or be rude to me as a result. So that's what's burning me out because it's ridiculous. I, I'm doing something to really try to further educate people because not everybody is interested in just learning about cameras and lenses and modifiers and lighting. There are a lot of photographers and ironically, a lot of younger photographers who really appreciate the exposure to the history. And I don't mean exposure to the history in terms of like facts and dates and stuff. Like when most of us went to school and we had to remember crap like that. No, no, no. I'm talking about exposure to the history to be able to understand to be able to understand how photography has evolved, to be able to understand how these incredibly accomplished photographers approached their work, how they thought, what their process was. That's why I share. So anyway, enough whining about me because this isn't about me, but you know, my solution, that's it. I delete stuff. So for any of you that like to debate or like to have an opinion, please understand I am always open to discourse, to conversation. I don't expect that everybody's going to agree with me, but 
If you were standing in front of me or any other person, your response would not to be to, to say, that's wrong, especially if you don't know that person personally. Your response would not be to say, I don't think it should be that way. I think it's this way because this is what I do. If you're standing in front of somebody and you don't know them, the respectful thing that most of you would do would be potentially to say, you know, I'm really curious that you say that. I've always been under the impression that this is how something works or this would be the best way. Can you share more about why you think that's important or why you do that? Or better yet, simply, given that we're sharing a link to information about that photographer, that person would go and learn about that photographer first because God forbid they would learn something that would help them improve themselves and then come back if they still really disagree and have a conversation about that. So if you're one of those people that are so inclined to just have an opinion and share it with the world, I ask you before you type and do so, the whole world of favors. This is not just in photography. Ask yourself, do you really think the world gives a crap about your opinion? You'll notice if you listen close, when I'm sharing opinion, opinions with you, I label it. I label it and I tell you, okay, this is my opinion. Otherwise, I'm sharing my experience with you or I'm sharing facts with you. It takes practice. It does. It takes a lot of practice. It has to matter because facts do matter. And that's something that applies to our world in general right now. So I'm seeing that a lot of you are struggling with marketing. So, um, and that's a common one. But so now for those of you that typed social media and pricing, so here, Danny says social media, Grant says pricing, uh, Ty figuring out what to charge, Willie sales and marketing, Corey sales and marketing. Uh, let's see, Eric, okay, doing budgets. So, you know, business stuff. Uh, Kalen dealing with social media, Joe Dussel sales and marketing, Crystal marketing. So here's the thing. One, I've done a couple of videos, older videos. So yeah, you got to go look them up. But I've done some videos on that. I've done articles about that on my website. I'll do you a solid, but you better do me a solid in return. I will do probably a couple of nights of social media and business and marketing for photographers. But here's what I need you to understand, okay? In order for us to do that right, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is personal branding. Because personal branding actually sets up the social media conversation and the marketing conversation. All of you are making marketing much harder than it needs to be. And, and look, there's some learning, there's some effort, there's some work, and there are very potentially some aspects of marketing and business client interactions that you may not ultimately enjoy. So I'm, I'm not saying that, oh, it's easy to bully you. No, I, I'm saying, look, you have to open your mind up. Because here, let me give you the first mind twist. So you can stew on this for a week or two until we come back to these topics. But if I do this, I expect you're all going to be there, right? Let's talk about social media in general and the fact that so many people over the age of 40 are intimidated by it and bitch about it and hate it. And yet you heard me say a few minutes ago, I consider social media to be a gift on three levels, right? But in this piece of the conversation, that level is the marketing aspect. So for those of you that are over the age of 40 that struggle with social media, let me point something out to you. I'm going to try and flip it all upside down. And I want you to think about it until we come back and have this conversation. Social media, especially as it applies to photographers and marketing and, and many other things, but we're photographers. That's what we care about right now, right? Social media is not some invention of the internet and Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and all these people. Stop looking at it that way. It's much simpler than that, much simpler. Social media, when we're talking about business and marketing and advertising, social media is simply the act of being social and using a computer and the internet to do it. 
my marketing approach, the things that I do as a marketer online are exactly the same as what I did in 1985 when I was shooting weddings. Exactly the same with one difference. I do it on websites instead of the yellow pages. I do it on websites instead of relying on word of mouth that could take a year or two years for a reference to kind of go full circle and come back to me as a new client. Hell, now you can do it in 10 seconds. How amazing is that? It's incredible. So one of the first things that you have to do to allow you to get your head wrapped around the social media stuff is you've got to stop thinking of it as social media and it's all, oh, it's Facebook and it's computers and it's the internet and it's all this kid stuff because I've already told you the kids don't use it. It's old farts that use social media. If you're over the age of the 40, over 40, you're the prime demographic for the kind of social media that we're talking about for photographers. So stop blaming the kids. They're smart. They all said the hell with this crap. We're going over here and we're using these smaller things be, where we can just share with the people that we want to share. And you know why they do it? They do that so that assholes can't come and comment on their stuff. The only people that are going to comment on their stuff are people that they know, people that they allow to comment. So at least if one of their friends is a jerk, they can call that friend out for being a jerk and then they can cut him out of their lives if they need to, but they don't have complete strangers coming at them. So first things first, over 40, stop thinking you got it all figured out and you're the smart ones. Because when it comes to this stuff, no, the kids are. The kids are much more evolved than we are. And I stand by that. I really do. So it's really about changing the way you view it. And, and I'm, so I'm not trying to be like, oh, fancy and cutesy with it. I'm really serious. Marketing today is the same it was as it was in the mid-1980s and probably before that. It's just that you do it on a computer and on websites. Now, just like anything else, just like taking pictures, are there shortcuts? Are there little techniques that will improve results or help you with this? Of course, yes. But the basic concept and the basic philosophy is the same. So let's go back to the 1980s. Here's the last piece of your social media lesson for the night. You think today, you take a great picture, you put it online, everybody should care because you took a great picture. But you forget, you're the only person, the only person who had that experience. You were the only person that had that experience of making that image. So why should anyone else care? I mean, in all fairness, there is no shortage of photographs for people to look at, none, right? So why should anybody care about your pictures? So back in the 80s, it was really no different. Now we didn't have pictures in our hands, on our TVs, or, you know, computers, there were no computers yet. We, we didn't have all that, but still photographers had this really bad habit of being like, I'm a photographer. Look, look at all this gear that I bought and I know how to go into a dark room and develop pictures. I'm special. Well, okay, so what happens then? People want a proof. Step one. So if you're a wedding photographer, they want to see photo albums, right? So you have to show proof. And then step two, while you're showing them the proof and having conversations with them, they would be doing the exact same things Bride do today. They would be essentially evaluating you. Is this person a jerk? Are they nice? Are they friendly? I'm considering spending the most important day of my life with this person, calling the shots. Because back then, DJs weren't a thing. It was the photographers that pretty much ran the wedding. There weren't even wedding planners. So, you know, if you were a wedding photographer back then, you ran the show. You decided when the cake was getting cut, when the guard was being tossed, you, you ran the show. Period. So they wanted to know, were you the kind of person they wanted doing that? It's the same today. None of that has changed. But yet today, photographers still slap a picture up on social media and expect that suddenly the phone's going to ring or better yet, email or text messages are going to come flying in. Why? It doesn't work that way. 
You have to give people a reason to care. That's what sales and marketing is. So here, here's the downside now. Now that I made it easy, I'm going to make it hard for some of you. Sorry. The downside is good sales and marketing is storytelling. Stories are emotional. Anything that's emotional allows people to make a connection. You get people to make a connection with your story and what you do, boom, people want to work with you and they will buy what you're selling. Done. So I'll talk more about that. But all of you that are saying, oh, sales and marketing, you better show up, right? Because the story's the same, honestly. I'm not kidding. You can go back and get marketing books from like the 1970s and 1980s and read them. You'll be just as smart as any of these people doing social media books today. You will be just as smart. Because here's the thing that for photographers, it doesn't matter what day of the week you post. It doesn't matter what time of the day you post. None of you does that matter. None of you. Is that like a real thing? Hell yes. For influencers, for companies that are spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on marketing, and they need to make sure that they are getting every little ounce of impact out of what they do. Yes. But keep in mind those same companies, they also have entire staffs dedicated to doing it. For a solopreneur, a solo entrepreneur like yourselves and marketing, does that stuff matter? No, it does not. It absolutely does not. Don't overwhelm yourself. That brings us back to one of my big complaints about what a lot of you do with YouTube. You spend so damn much time watching YouTube and then you go out and buy all the crap that you see on YouTube and then you can't shoot the side of a barn if you're standing right in front of it because you've got too much gear and too much knowledge, but no actual experience. All that knowledge in your head is useless if you can't translate it to do something with it. You're better off doing YouTube and then go get a PhD in YouTube. If you don't get that, you need to be married to a PhD like my wife. My wife will be the first person to say a PhD is somebody that knows a whole lot about nothing. Because most PhDs, their research is in this really tiny little narrow sliver of space and they know everything there is to know about it. But beyond that, they tend to ignore the rest of the world. So they don't know about other stuff, but they know about that. Having all this information doesn't do you any good unless you can translate it and do something with it, right? So uh, Crystal, what made me choose this lesson today? Honestly, because I'm just pissed off with people on social media. I don't know if you're here for that part of the conversation, but, but that's why. I, I'm just so, fr I'm frustrated with the way photographers behave. Not like it's my responsibility to care or to change it. And I'm doubly frustrated because I know my responses aren't always perfect. And so, yeah, it's, it's irritating. That's all. Um, but with some other conversations I've had with photographers and caught them kind of, I don't want to say whining, but complaining about aspects of their work and things they have to do, I realized it's like, you know what? Everybody's got stuff that they don't like. If they're being honest with themselves, there, there are aspects of what you do that you don't like. I don't care if you're just a, a photographer that shoots landscapes on, um, on the weekend, right? There, there are things that you don't like about the process. And I, I think more often than not, there are solutions, but the solutions begin with being willing to kind of change the way you view that problem. So I'm not saying to anybody like, suck it up, deal with it because it's part of being a photographer. You're not going to hear that come out of my mouth on any of it. But understand some of the things that you may not like may be presenting some obstacles for you. Fine we've got to figure out how to, how to solve that, how to bridge that and then make it easier. Okay. Um, let's see, McCullough imagery. What I hate about being a photographer is your work can be more than good enough or better than the industry standard, but doesn't mean a thing. You need to be in front of the right people. Uh, see, I look at that. So here, I just said a minute ago, right? Um, the challenge that you have, uh, McCullough imagery is, you have to change the way you're viewing it. And, and look, what's the, what's the obvious thing that we all do? All of us. So again, I'm not, I'm not going to judge anybody through any of these. But what's the thing that we automatically do as humans? Well, we automatically view the problem through our eyes, through our perspective. Do our clients care about that? No, they don't. Should they care about that? No, actually, they shouldn't. It's not their problem. 
just like as frustrated as I am with the people that make comments on these photo quotes that I post, it's not their problem. They're jerks. They feel they need to have an opinion, so they have an opinion. That's why I just started deleting everything, right? It's actually my problem, and that's my solution. Even that, though, unfortunately, irritates some people. So that's what I'm vocalizing about tonight. But McCulloch, so here's the thing. Um, in your mind and in your evaluation, and I'm sure friends, relatives, and maybe even some clients have told you that your work is, quote, more than good enough or better than the industry standard. I would flip the script and I would put the responsibility back on yourself because you say, you go on, say then, you need to be in front of the right people. Well, that's the same if you're selling cars. That's the same if you're starting a business and trying to get people to finance your business. That's the same in any business, right? If you're, if you're trying to sell apples to people that only eat oranges, you're in front of the wrong people. If you're trying to sell oranges to people that only eat the freshest, ripest oranges, but yours were ripe two days ago, then yours aren't going to be good enough for those people because their standards are different. If you only sell Macintosh oranges, but they don't like Macintosh oranges, they only like navel oranges, does that mean that your work's not good enough? No, it means that your work does not meet their desire or need. So the things that you have to be looking at, and you got to be honest with yourself, you got to be looking at it from the standpoint of number one, is my work really that good? Number two, you got to be looking at it from the standpoint is, well, okay, maybe my work is really good. And you know what? Maybe my work is better. But is it exactly the kind of work that they want? One thing's for sure, folks. Don't sit back. And I don't care if you suck or if you're amazing. Don't think the world's going to come to your doorstep. It doesn't work that way. Now, some of you will say, yeah, but you know, Joe, you're talking about social media. That's exactly what happens. People get discovered out of the middle of nowhere. Why do they get discovered out of the middle of nowhere? Because they're actually insanely talented and they have proven it. See, because in the photography world, how do you really stand out? Do you really stand out because your work is good? Do you really stand out because your work is great? No. That is expected. If your work is not technically sound, you're a fool if you think you're going to be successful. Period. What makes you stand out? Being different. That's what makes you stand out. How many times have you guys heard me talk about, if everybody's over here, all of you are over there with your 8600s and your seven foot umbrellas, trying not to have them blow away on the sea stands outside on the beach at high noon. And where's Joe? Joe's in the studio doing something completely different. You couldn't pay me enough money to take all that stuff out on the beach and try and overpower sun and do all that for one simple reason. Everybody's doing it. So why would I do that? Because that devalues my work. And then those same photographers do that. They're the ones, the ones on the beach with the strobes and the umbrellas trying to overpower the sun. They're the ones that are the first to complain about, oh, there's so much competition. All these damn people with iPhones, man. They say people will pay them with iPhones. They won't pay me. Yeah, because the people with iPhones are 20 times more creative than you are because you're doing the same crap that every other idiot is trying to do. And I mean that, idiot. Like choosing to have competition, gang, that is foolish. That is no way to run a business. That is no way to be successful. It's just not. You're cutting your margins down the minute you do that. I mean, a great example, you know, do your research, do your history. If you're in the United States, Burger King and McDonald's, people tend to think they compete with each other. They don't compete with each other over food. That's what they let us think. You know what they compete with each other over? Real estate. 
who can buy the best real estate? Because that's really where the value to McDonald's and Burger King is. It's the real estate. We all just think it's about the food because we want it to be about us. We want to feel like we hold the power. They're not competing for us. They're competing for real estate. So chasing all that stuff is, is not going to get you anywhere. You got to do you. You got to find your unique value proposition. Okay? That's how you set yourself apart. That's how you get people to care about what you do. There are plenty of people. Look, come on. You're sitting here listening to me. There are plenty of people that just think I'm a jackass. And then there are other people that will say, man, I really appreciate the fact that you tell it straight and don't sugarcoat it and that you're straightforward and you're honest. That's how life works. Some people are going to appreciate that forwardness. Other people are just going to think, oh, he's an ass because he's not going to take 20 minutes to say something that he can say in three and so he can sugarcoat it and be politically correct and all that stuff. And look, I'm not saying that it's wrong to do that. <laughs> Trust me, I'd have probably have had a lot less friction in my life if I had more filters and took the time and sugarcoated things. That's just not who I am. Blame my mother. But that's not who I am. I tell it the way it is and I tell it from the heart. So yeah, I can be, I could definitely come across as aggressive at times. That's a fault. And it does get me in trouble. I work on that. I'm not perfect at it. But the fact of the matter is, I'm always trying to help people in the process, period, right? And so that's going to connect with some people, mainly you guys, or it's not going to connect and they're watching somebody else. And, and I respect that, right? Because that's the other thing you have to understand when you start talking about sales and marketing. Nobody gets every customer, right? They, they just don't, right? So you can't go at it like you got to have the most customers. Because number one, you can't handle the most customers. So you don't want the most customers. You want the customers that see the value in what you do and who are willing to pay you a premium for that. That's what you want. You heard me use the line before, the way a photographer makes money, do what you do to the best of your ability and then find the people who are dumb enough to pay you for it. That's how it works. It's, it's not really a joke, right? I mean, that's it's how it works. So so anyway, uh, scrolling on up here, F and 89, have I noticed an increase in people being rude on social media during COVID and post-COVID? Yeah, I, because I think, you know, I think everybody's, everybody's frustrated. Uh, you know, as much as I'm griping, I, that's part of the reason why I, I stopped engaging because I, you know, that's just stupid. There's no benefit in debating somebody on social media at all. No benefit. And, and here's the thing. Even if you finally win the debate, even if the person finally says, God, you know, I never thought of it that way. You, you're right. Oh, my God. What you have to look at is how much time did you invest going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth just to prove to that one person that they were wrong? Like, where's the value? There's no value to you or to anybody else, right? There's no value. So that's why I realized, like, wow, Joe, that's like incredibly stupid. You just you can't debate people. Just delete it. Delete it. Make it go away. And if the person, if I feel, you know, if the person's obnoxious enough, then yeah, I'm gonna block them. And 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 that's it. Life is is too short. That just means that they haven't figured out yet I'm not the right person for, you know, for them to be following. But but I think, you know, the bigger picture um with COVID. Um, if you're in the United States with the political climate, right? Um, people are angry. People are frustrated. I don't care what side of the fence it's on. So, so again, we're not pointing any fingers. I don't want to be naming any names, none of that crap, but look, people are frustrated. And so I think that because when you are, you know, typing on a device or you're typing on a keyboard, you're not looking at a person. You can't see that person. You can't see their body language. You can't see their expression. You can't really hear their tone. I don't care how many emojis they use, right? So I think that one, people are more frustrated, but two, because we all tend to overwhelm ourselves in life. You know, we all tend to multitask. We're doing too much. Frequently when we're responding to messages and comments, we're doing it because we have 30 seconds before, you know, the wife's going to come to get in the car or before the kids need us to do this or, or whatever, right? So we're trying to cram it in and we're not being as thoughtful and as mindful as we should be when we do it. And we don't have to be because there's no person here, right? We're all by ourselves with our own thoughts. 
And, you know, even if our own thought is like, God, what a jerk. It's easy to type that when you're all by yourself. If you're standing in front of that person, unless you're a whole lot bigger than them and you're willing to fight somebody, like you're going to come out with, God, what a jerk you are. Right? I mean, that's just not how most of us will behave in person. So I do think it's it's gotten worse. I think it's gotten worse in every aspect of life. So yes, I'm focused on photographers and that's why I'm giving you guys as photographers grief. Don't do it. Don't be that way. Uh, I do think it's, I think, I think it's very prevalent um, in pretty much all walks of life. So, um, so let's see here, Marcus, I'm a hobby photographer. Gear was expensive. Would be nice to get a little bit back from it without, uh, Scraping on Shutterstock for a lot of work and then getting almost nothing from it back. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, Marcus, there are solutions, but you have to be willing to, to kind of pay a price. And, and what I mean by that is um, the stock photo industry has pretty much um, evaporated from what it used to be. Uh, back in the 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s, stock photography was an extremely profitable industry. Uh, and it was even an industry where there would be photographers who were essentially assignment photographers who, you know, a stock photo agency would contact them and say, hey, we need you to go to this country and photograph these people doing this, right? It was a pretty cool gig. Um, and not only would they get paid to go do it, but then they would also get residuals on the images when the images were sold. Um, now, you've got an industry that is actually dominated by Russians uh, and this is not a Russian suck thing, please. This is just stating uh, probably the largest stock photographers in the world right now in terms of volume and sales. They are mostly Russian and Ukrainian, Eastern European. Let's do it that way. That way we're not labeling any countries. Eastern European, okay? Um, and uh, frequently they literally own warehouses where they will have six, seven, eight photographers working for them full time and all day long, five days a week, they're just shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, working with models and, and, and doing setups and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and they're pumping out volume. And that's why so many of these stock photography websites, even if you go to some of the better sites like a Shutterstock uh, and even Getty, some of the stuff you see now, it's crap, right? It just, it really is. It's crap. But here's the thing. The margins are so little I would argue that these photographers are being very smart. They're going to go into a session. They may shoot 500 frames. And instead of knocking it down to like five frames that really have value, they're probably going to upload 100 frames, which are all small variations, okay? And some of those frames are not that great. But you know what? As long as they're up there, somebody's potentially going to buy them. And since they're up there, they take up more space on the website. And every time a picture comes up, you can click to see more from that photographer. So that bad picture can potentially market a good picture for them and make them a sale. So, uh, you know, my advice is for you, Marcus, a couple of things. Number one, I always tell a joke. It's not ha-ha funny. It's actually kind of real, but it, it's meant to at least be a little lighthearted. It starts with the idea that professional photographers are all kind of idiots. Right? I'm raising my hand first. Here's why. I've only ever met two ways or two types of people that get into photography, okay? For, for the reasons I get into it, two, two paths. Um, and, and neither one of them is actually a great idea because I haven't met anybody that's ever bought their first camera for the purpose of making money. You buy a camera or nowadays you start with one of these and you take pictures like, oh, this is fun and you kind of get hooked. So you want to get a better camera. So you have lenses and that kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, you add a, more, a little bit more and you add a little bit more and, and, you know, the bug bites, right? And then you're hooked. But then people come up with one of two crazy ideas. The first one, which is kind of where you're at. Wouldn't it be cool if I can make a little bit of money with this stuff because then... I could buy some more gear. Now, to most people, that sounds really logical, right? Like, hey, that's pretty smart. Well, kinda. I'll tell you why it's not in a second. But then there's the other path. And again, I've never heard a third option. The other path is, wouldn't it be amazing if I could pay my bills with these cameras? That's the really dumb one of the two. They're both not too smart. 
Why are they not too smart? Why am I saying that? Because the minute you make that decision, the minute you make that decision to make money with these cameras, all the rules change. And look, I'm not trying to discourage any of you, but I'm keeping it real. Don't kid yourselves, right? The rules change. Because the minute you want to make money, it's no longer about you. It's no longer about your photography. It's about your customer, period. So if you are not at that point shooting with a customer in mind, if you are not working with clients, you know, if you're taking on clients, if you're not working to keep them happy and giving them images that are going to meet their needs and their desires, you will fail in that business. So it's no longer about you. And if you're not careful, you will take the fun out of your photography. That's why you routinely hear me joke. I still don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. It will involve a camera, but it probably won't be fashion portraiture. Heck no. I do the fashion portrait because it's great for teaching, right? But you know, I started as a photojournalist. I've done portraits and weddings. I've done little leagues and sports teams. I've done commercial advertising and food and fashion and modeling portfolios. Because if I get bored, burned out on something, I'll move on. And by exploring a new area of photography, that's energizing and it's exciting. It gives me something new to learn. That keeps it fun. For me, I'm not saying you need to be like that, but I'm saying understand that, yeah, it, you know, you would certainly probably do better, Marcus, doing client work. And that client work could be commercial advertising type stuff. It could be, you know, doing portraits. Of what it depends on what you enjoy. You absolutely don't want to be shooting things that you don't enjoy. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do your, your best work, you know, at all. Okay. Um, there were one or two other things back here that I saw that weren't business and marketing. So I just want to scroll back before I run out of time. Um, let's see, budgets, social media, maybe that was it. Oh, Beverly, editing. Yeah, Crystal says editing, which now you don't do yourself. And you know, here's, here's the interesting thing about, about editing. So full disclosure, folks, I, I met Crystal's from, from my area. I met her a few weeks ago, insanely talented young woman. Um, and I told her this to her face so I can say it on here. I, I hate her just a little bit because she is so damn talented. And what's really amazing about her talent she has no clue what she's doing. I told her that to her face. I can say that now. It's not an insult. It is honestly something that I admire. Um, I spent an afternoon with Crystal in my studio and, you know, talking about her work and her gear. And really what I wanted to get was kind of a sense of what was her knowledge base in photography and that. And um, for somebody that's been in photography as long as I have, the traditional response about how she has learned and gotten to where she is now would be, man, you did everything backwards. But then I have to look at her work. And I have to look at her work and say, I can't say she did anything backwards. Right? Um, because I learned in a very traditional way, I look at what she does and honestly, it blows my mind. Um, and what I realize when I meet young people like this is that she's a great example of how our industry is changing for the better, but let me explain, um, and how the world's changing. And we need to keep up. And so the good news for me, selfishly, I'm not that far behind because I'm the one that's always pushing back against rules. You know, there are no rules, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I firmly believe all of that. But, and Crystal's not alone, but people like Crystal, they, honestly, they take it to a whole new level. Uh, and how do they do that, right? They do that because, David, thank you so much for the super chat, man. I really appreciate it. Um, they do that because one, they're incredibly creative. Um, you've heard me talk about creativity before, even if you don't see yours. And by the way, if you say to yourself, I'm not that creative, stop, 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 stop. That is a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
Are there people more creative than you? Very likely there are, yes. But does that mean you're not creative? No, it does not. Not being creative is a choice. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this not as some meme or not as some motivator. I'm telling you this, the science of creativity. We're all born with, with a set amount of creativity. And indeed, some people are higher up on the scale, okay? Yes, but the fact of the matter is, all of us are capable of human, as human beings of expanding our creativity. So if you just happen to be a person that's lower on the scale, are you necessarily gonna surpass somebody that's way up on the scale? You may not. But life's not about being the best. It's about being the best that you can be, right? But here's, here's what the younger generation has that my generation didn't have. And yeah, I'm jealous. But at the same time, I think it's really cool. One, they have gear that helps them create better pictures than I had when I was younger. Cameras today are amazing. Software today is amazing. I benefit from that. Younger people benefit in the sense that they're not as limited. If they've got an idea, their cameras are going to help them achieve that idea much easier than we could do back in the 70s and, and you know, the 80s, okay? So, you know, the other thing that younger generation has going for it, and, and Crystal, yeah, I see you, 35. That's young. I'll, I'll trade you any day. Um, the other thing the younger generation is going for, which is kind of what I was talking about before with social media, younger generation today is much more in touch with what they want out of life. And I don't mean like the way it was in my generation, like what's your career going to be? Like, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? Oh my God. No, no, no. I just mean what their priorities are. Even the way they spend money, right? They're, they're much more inclined to spend money on experiences than they are on belongings and owning a house. Like that, that was, you know, that was my generation. That was the boomers, that's generation X, even millennials. But the younger generation, that's not their priority. I admire that because they're, they're like, they're living their best life. And they're having a lot more fun doing it. And they're not letting people tell them, or I shouldn't say people tell them, but they're not listening to people who tell them this is what's expected of you. So, you know, I, I think where we can all learn a little bit uh, about that is, is to realize that for those of us that are older, especially, a lot of the habits that we were taught and, and a lot of the habits we've had for a long time are actually what's making so many of these things harder for us, right? We need to let go of those habits. Uh, Gustav's got a comment here. You know, if you think you've got competition with anyone around you and in your town, then you've already lost the game. There is no competition. And you're right. You guys saw me talk about this a couple of weeks back. You've seen the article that's on my website. Um, there, there is no competition. It's a crazy thing. The other thing, uh, I, I'm doing a presentation that is not a photography presentation. I'm, I'm doing it for uh, a, a company in a few weeks. And one of the topics that I'm talking about that, but it applies in the photography world, I'm talking about imposter syndrome. When I was talking to the client about the ideas, it evolves around creativity, but not photography. I'm using photography as the metaphor throughout this presentation. And um, one of the things that this client talked to me about for their, their team that this presentation is gonna be made to is that you know, they really struggle with imposter syndrome. Um, and so the first question I asked them, I was like, well, you know, um, how blunt am I allowed to be? Because, you know, and this person has seen my YouTube videos. I said, you, you see, you know, I don't have a lot of filters. Am I allowed to be that guy or do I have to dial it back? And they're like, no, 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 you know, throw it out there. And so here's the thing, like, you know, we all hear about this imposter syndrome stuff. And I know there's some of you are here probably really buy into that. And excuse my French, but I'm going to tell you right now, imposter syndrome is bullshit. It's bullshit. Imposter syndrome is something that a bunch of people figured out, hey, this is a cool label. We can make a lot of money off of this. And even people, you know, even psychologists and therapists are like, oh, it's a thing now. So now that it's a thing, once, once you know, the psychology world says it's a thing, we got to go make money for it. But, but here's the thing I hate to tell you. And, and those of you that are my age, you'll confirm this. Those of you that are older than me, you'll confirm this. Baby boomers, Gen X, older millennials. Go look up the definition of imposter syndrome. 
And I defy you to tell me that you didn't struggle with imposter syndrome when you were in your 20s and even as a teenager. The fact is, you did. I did. I still do. But it's not imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, the minute I use that label, the minute I say, oh, yeah, you know, imposter syndrome, it's so tough. It's so brutal. I'm giving myself an excuse. I'm giving myself an excuse to fail. It's the same, it's the same thing as saying, oh, there's so much competition. No, there's not. Do what you do. Sometimes life is tough. Sometimes life is challenging. But there is a reality. And this isn't, you know, this isn't the tough talk. This is just, this is how it is. There is a reality about trying to thrive in a creative environment. That reality is you better be willing to fail. You don't have to be the best, but you better be willing to fail. If you are going to excel, if you are going to succeed, if you are going to create work that people care about, that people notice, that people look at and say, wow. And remember, trust me, you want people to say, wow. When somebody looks at your work and says, oh, you must have a really nice camera, that's not the compliment that you're looking for. We all know that, right? For me, my favorite, it's wow. But to do that, you gotta be willing to fail. If you're gonna say, oh, but you know, I have imposter syndrome, then yeah, you'll never fail. Why? Because you'll be afraid to try. But imposter syndrome is not new. The label's new, right? Imposter syndrome has existed for anybody of any age who gives a shit, who wanted to do something better than what they were doing, who wanted to succeed at what they're doing. Imposter syndrome has existed for anybody who's passionate about what they were doing. It's not new. So look, I'm not minimizing the people that struggle with it. I want to be clear. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just saying, look, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everyone that has ever talked to me about imposter syndrome, the longer I have had a conversation with them, the more I realize they don't have imposter syndrome. They're just afraid of failure. And honestly, they learned that label and now they're using it as an excuse. Don't use it as an excuse. Fail. Fail and you actually stand a chance to succeed, right? So listen, we're actually, we're just after seven o'clock. Um, first and foremost, all of you that are still here, just thank you. Thank you because I kind of hijacked tonight so that I could vent for a little bit and I feel much better and I appreciate that. Um, you have my word. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I, I have a bunch of presentations that I've done about marketing. Uh, if we're gonna do this conversation, uh, you know, and everything from pricing to marketing, running a business, we need to start with the concept of personal branding because what that's gonna do for us, it's gonna help us create kind of a new baseline for all of you of what is marketing as a photographer really about? What is social media about for a photographer? Like, how, do, how does a photographer really make use of it? So I don't mean how big should your files be and what time of day should you post and which platform should you be on. I mean, conceptually, it's really kind of taking a, a really hard, honest look about what you currently do on social media, but through a different set of eyes so that you can realize, wow, like, yeah, I'm not connecting with people at all. And it's my fault. It's not even about my photography. It's what I'm doing and the way that I'm doing it. We start there. Then we can get into marketing and get more detailed with all of it. And then we can even get into a little bit with pricing. But I will forewarn you, all of you, when it comes to the pricing stuff, I've got a three-letter answer, which I can expand that three letters because it's an acronym, PPA. That's Professional Photographers of America. You need to join, period. Um, wait till next week. I'll share a link where you can get your first month at like $35 off. Um, yes, it's an affiliate link. I make a couple bucks, but I'll share a link with you. Um, and also I will tell you that if you join now, if you join PPA now, um, like before the end of the year, I think it's before actually the second week of December, something like that. I'll share all this information next week. You can attend your first Imaging USA 
for free. So Imaging USA is January 22, 23, 24, I believe. Yeah, 22, 23, 24. Pre-cons are January 20 and 21. So it's right after the new year. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. I will tell you, hands down, it's, it's, it is the biggest photography event in the United States now, especially since Photo Plus didn't happen and since WPPI has been downsized. Highly recommend it. Um, I'll be there uh, doing hands-on pre-cons and also doing a, um, a class all about color and color theory. But uh, if you join before the end of the year, you can attend your first one for free. So that's like, you know, $400 worth of Imaging USA that you get for free um, as a member, not to mention the equipment insurance, everything else. So we'll dig into that. Uh, in the meantime, though, do me a favor, right? Uh, on the social media posts, Facebook, or if you're part of my Todd Knowledge community, the ones that I put up for uh, this last frame tonight, they will stay up there permanently. Do me a favor and comment on those threads with some specifics about your business and marketing struggles. That way, I'm not just going to come back and kind of do the generic 30,000 foot presentation. I can make sure that I can connect to some of the specific things that you're running into. And as I always say, let's solve some problems. Okay. All right, gang. Again, thank you all for listening. Have a great week. I'll see you guys next week. Adios.